Hi everyone, my name's Cooper Shooten and I'm a beekeeper and beekeeping researcher at Southern Cross University in Northern New South Wales and I'm also the project leader for Bees for Sustainable Livelihoods Research Group. So I work with an amazing team of, of researchers here in Australia and that work in the honeybee industry, but also um, some amazing people who work in the bee industries in Southeast Asia and the Pacific region. At the moment, I have programs up and running in um, Fiji and Papua New Guinea that are funded by the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, which I'm going to talk about, and some of the photos come from today for this presentation. So big shout out and um, thanks to all those who invited me to present at this excellent event um, and all the sponsors for this um, Tokale Beekeepers Virtual Field Day. I wish I could be with you all in person doing some beekeeping and um, catching up afterwards, um, but hopefully it won't be too long before we'll be able to do that again. So today I'm going to be talking about the five pillars for sustainable beekeeping development, which is a bit of a, it's a conceptual framework. So it's these core pillars and considerations of what to consider when you're implementing a beekeeping program overseas. Um, but it's also something that we can apply to our beekeeping operations here in Australia. I'm going to be talking about why beekeeping is one of the most mutualistic forms of agriculture, in my opinion, and also some of the benefits that beekeeping has to offer for these rural communities and what actually needs to be considered to make them successful. So benefits of beekeeping, as we all know, bees produce honey and that can be sold for money, but there's a whole range of other benefits that beekeeping has to offer in terms of a livelihood or income strategy for some of these rural communities overseas and also here in Australia. So um, bees, uh, their role in pollination obviously is critical. So not only of natural forest areas, but also for agricultural crops. And you could imagine if you're a subsistence farmer having a significant increase in your crop production uh, and the quality of that fruit set as well, that's going to have a major impact on your, on your life. Bees also produce other products such as beeswax and propolis and you can value add to these to produce lots of other amazing products for lip balm and candles and soaps and surfboard wax and surf zinc and all sorts of different products. Um, to service the beekeeping industry you need a whole range of different things too such as bee boxes and frames and um, veils and gloves and smokers and um, you know, nucleus colonies and queen bees. So these all represent viable income opportunities. So they're businesses that people can start up overseas, not just about managing the bees themselves, if that makes sense. It's something that's accessible to marginalised groups. It doesn't require the ownership of land and it can be conducted on, on land that's um, pretty marginal. So in regions where you've got really steep slopes or the soil's not very fertile for cropping, um, you can run pretty amazing beekeeping operations. Um, beekeeping can be a lot of fun, I'll put down the bottom there, so I'm sure you all know bees can be a lot of fun, but I think it's pretty important to consider that um, because you know, often in life we're usually going to be successful at the things that we actually enjoy doing. Um, for beekeeping um, overseas, there's a lot of different associations and clubs and even like what we're doing today um, for this presentation series, um, it's about getting together and working with other people and sharing our passions. Um, people can also uh, have opportunities overseas and even here in Australia to travel for beekeeping work, um, particularly on the Pacific Labor Mobility Scheme for some of the communities overseas to be able to support our beekeeping industries here in terms of um, yeah, skilled labor. Uh, beekeeping doesn't take up a lot of space, so if you don't own much land, that's pretty good. Um, and like I say, it can be conducted in marginalized areas. Uh, because it's not competitive for space, it also means that beekeeping can help to reduce pressures to clear land. And so, I mean, in combination with having to have a good understanding of the flow of resources within the operational range of a beekeeper in order to be, you know, successful in producing a good, good crop of honey, um, you know, this can be a real incentive to protect the forest areas if these beekeepers have, you know, a good understanding of that these forest areas are generating an income for them. It also enhances communications unlike other types of cropping systems. So it means beekeepers have to communicate with some of their neighbours and talk about how some pesticides are actually impacting on their bees and that sort of thing. Uh, it's something that doesn't take a lot of time. And some beekeepers that are listening now are probably like, yeah, right. <laughs> but um, in comparison to lots of other types of farming systems, beekeeping can actually take quite a little uh, amount of time in comparison and returns on time can be really important. Um, it's something that beekeeping, you know, in terms of a honey product can be used for cash income, but also as a barter and trade commodity um, and can represent an important sort of cash savings within the household. 
And a really interesting one is that honey doesn't perish. And so what our research is showing is that um, in many of these regions where people don't have access to financial services, such as a bank and loan schemes and things like that, they're using their beehives as a form of savings or their, their honey money. Their hives are like a form of a bank and um, you know they'll be lining up at, at the front to pay their um, school fees at the same time you know the, the, the where the places that are purchasing honey there's the same lineup so people are coming down with all their honey to sell it so they can get their cash and pay for some of their fees and that's really important in terms of income smoothing you could imagine if you just had all your cash in your pocket or on your and your table it's uh, at home it's probably not that safe um, but also you probably spend it pretty fast too lots of different health benefits for honey and that can be really important in areas where you don't have access to you know good health care um, and so I guess another one I just wanted to point out too, obviously there's lots of these, but um, honeybees have amazing capacity for ch climate change adaptation. We find honeybees um, to be productive and prolific all around the world uh, in highly diverse climates and therefore finding ways to support and integrate them into typical agricultural farming practices is pretty valuable economic and scientific and um, social pursuit. So as we can see, the, the value of honeybees and beekeeping in lots of these developing countries and here in Australia is worth more than just honey, that's for sure. So how to implement sustainable beekeeping. So I mean, lots of people are getting excited about bees. Um, there's obviously lots of significant positive outcomes of beekeeping, but in many cases around the world, we're seeing lots of programs starting up. People are getting bees, but they're not always successful. Their colonies don't always survive. If you, I've asked hundreds of people who've worked in development practice in um, low and middle income countries overseas, all these programs that are implemented and they, the results are showing that if you give you know, perhaps 100 beekeepers a hive and some beekeeping lessons and come back in three years, you'll have about an 80% failure rate. So attrition amongst beekeeping adopters is a chronic problem. Colony losses are high. Uh, support for and coordination of the sector is generally pretty low. And people's practices and their production and income from beekeeping as a result is pretty inefficient at times. So today I'm going to be talking about these five pillars of beekeeping. Uh, they are education, extension, honeybee nutrition, pests and diseases, genetics and technology. Um, and they are, in my opinion, in order of importance. Um, but I'm going to start at number five and work my way down to number one because uh, this is technology is the one that people always seem to bring up first but in some cases it can be almost the least important so technology um, the key function of a bee box is to house some bees and given the range of success stories that ma of managing bees in various size hives um, we can only sort of surmise that this choice of what sort of sized hives to keep or the type of hive is more about the beekeeper's preference and what they have access to rather than how productive it is in that region potentially. So factors such as nutrition and flora, um, the age and genetics of the queen, pest and disease management, these are overriding issues which determine the productivity of the colony, not the shape, the size, material or colour of the bee box. So often people come to me and say, well, we should you know, have this type of hive overseas, but Often one of the best things to do is to use, you know, local people are usually using what works best for them already. So it can be really good to try to use local bees and local inputs. Um, and part of the reason for that is that it can sustain their operations long term if they actually have access to it. Um, another thing to consider here is that defining what beekeeping success looks like um, for different groups is, is different. I mean, we might see... You know, this beekeeping operation here in number two, this is um, beekeeping in Indonesia with a small Asian honeybee, Apis serrana. We could see that has been pretty, um, you know, pretty low productivity. You can't check the combs. It's pretty damaging to the bees if you want to get the honey out. But nevertheless, that coconut trunk hive there probably cost about one cent, if anything. Uh, and it takes the beekeeper not that much time to make it. You can make it out of local materials. And yes, the honey production is pretty low, maybe only five kilos from that colony in a year. But nevertheless, they can just have a hundred of them because it doesn't cost them much money. So there's lots of different benefits um, and opportunities, but also different pros and cons, I guess, to different beekeeping equipment. Number one there is um, honey hunting with a giant Asian honeybee, Apis dorsata. Um, that, that bee can't be, it's not a cavity nesting species, so you can't put that bee in a box. And you've got top bar hive beekeeping there. It seems to work for some groups overseas and also Langstroth beekeeping with Apis mellifera down the bottom there in Java. Um, so, you know, using Apis mellifera and, and there's sorts of 
uh, beekeeping systems can be very productive, but they also cost a lot of money to run. So a key thing here is to try to use local bees and local inputs. And remember that productivity is not always profitability. Some systems that are pretty low input actually can be pretty profitable in the long run. Genetics and bee breeding. The key thing here is to try to keep these bee breeding programs pretty simple for a lot of these communities. I mean, bees can be bred for lots of different things, as we know, increased productivity, their color, their pest and disease tolerance, temperament, ease of handling, hygienic behavior, reduced swarming tendencies, a um, whole range of different things. I mean, I'm still trying to teach my bees how to make me a coffee in the morning, but I'm still working on it. I'm sure this frost will get this sorted for us one day. Um, the demand for these queen bees overseas and even here in Australia often exceeds supply. So it's something to consider in these programs. So it's not just overseas, it's also about just increasing the supply of these queen bees. Believe it or not, aggressive bees are not that fun to work with and this can be a real impediment to people learning uh, beekeeping because all they're thinking about is getting stung rather than the actual biology of the bees and working out what's going on in these frames. <coughs> Often uh, local bees can be pretty well adapted to local conditions and importing queen bees can pose many risks and can often fail. Nevertheless, it can also be a pretty amazing opportunity for some of these areas that haven't had improved genetic stock. Often a hybrid probably will prevail in some of the projects we're working on at the moment um, with some queen bees um, from Australia with Dr. Rob Manning, WA, um, getting some queen bees over to Fiji and PNG, obviously going through very strict biosecurity protocols first. Um, but, I mean, our bees here haven't had um, the selective pressures for Varroa. So when these queen bees turn up, they may be very productive and easy to work with, but perhaps a hybrid may perform better because it hasn't necessarily had that, that exposure to Varroa, for example. One thing to consider when, when I'm working in some of these programs is that I often hear about bee breeding, but um, what is often observed is just simply multiplying queen bees from some of their better stock with no real good... Um, record keeping over time. So the, the key thing here with some of these programs is to keep the program simple, uh, focus on those core characteristics that are gonna be really important to them. Don't get too carried away trying to you know, incorporate too many things, just about temperament and how many yields and, and good record keeping over time. So often for evaluation, this should be undertaken at least twice annually because within bee colonies, the quality and the performance of any colony is gonna vary um, seasonally because of the conditions that they're exposed to. So that's um, bee breeding and genetics in some of these programs overseas. Pests and diseases and biosecurity. So the key thing is to be able to identify, monitor and manage pests and diseases. And that includes pests and diseases that we already have in country and the ones that we don't because some of our best biosecurity on the front line is, is you. It's uh, you as a beekeeper. It's our people that are out there opening hives on a daily basis and, and looking in their hive and going, gee whiz, I don't know what that is. I better report that because that could be something exotic. Um, so that's part of our strength in our pest surveillance systems. There's more than 40 known pests and diseases of honeybees globally. Um, obviously, we live in a, you know, a global climate now. We've got so much trade that we've got movement of different bee products and bees around the world. And so that means we're increasingly susceptible to different pests and disease risks. Um, in any location, the information regarding pests and disease distribution, their impacts and their management, is, is, it changes so rapidly, both throughout time and, and space where we move around the place. So um, some of these pests and diseases can be very difficult and almost impossible to identify without you know, different equipment. Um, and it's really important that the correct species be identified in order to implement appropriate monitoring and management programs. So we might think that varroa is all just one type of mite, but it actually is not. There's lots of different variations to a theme. Um, and even different mites in different places um, can have very different impacts on bees depending on their virus loading and, and all sorts of things like that. So key things here are to be able to you know, understand the seasonality of these different pests and diseases, um, be able to identify diseases and the cause of this, um, different pathogens and their modes of transmission and infection. Understanding the difference between an infectious and a non-infectious disease is pretty important. Um, appropriate identifying, uh, identification sorry, and monitoring techniques. So this can be really critical. Uh, and understanding what appropriate management response strategies are. That's because, um, I mean... If we're going to be using chemicals to control some of these pest diseases, for example, there's lots of different trade-offs that come into play here, such as, you know, the cost of it, whether people can actually afford it, 
um, how that impacts on the profitability of their whole enterprise, how effective those, those treatments are going to be at um, killing those, those pests and diseases, whether that can have any impacts on the honey quality or other bee products. Um, there can be issues of tolerance or resistance buildup amongst some of those pests and disease populations, but you can go to use that, that management option and it doesn't even work anymore. Um, also, the education extension around how to use it properly and not hurt yourself and ex, you know, actually you know, hurt yourself in the process or your bees and also access to some of these things. So there's some of the key considerations regarding pests and diseases, being able to effectively identify, monitor and manage them. Right, so the fourth pillar is honeybee nutrition. Um, believe it or not, bees can't just eat big McDonald's burgers all day long and be healthy. They need a diversity of floral resources coming into their hive in order for them to meet their nutritional requirements. So written up here, but the key thing to remember is that no trees, no bees, no honey, no money. Nectar is the primary carbohydrate source that's converted in, uh, into honey in the hive. Um, you can substitute this. The beekeepers can um, provide bees with sugar syrup when, in times of need. Um, and pollen is the primary protein source. So this has got the amino acids, fats, lipids, um, vitamins, and minerals. So most other issues can be um, rectified to some extent. So some pest and disease challenges can be overcome if we have good nutrition. So just when you're healthy, you can overcome and fight different pathogens and diseases. So nutrition is really critical here. Um, the value of nectar and pollen uh, production amongst flowering plants varies significantly in their quality, um, their quantity and also their seasonal availability. So it's really critical that beekeepers have a good understanding of what's in flower within the operational range so that they can make informed management decisions about when to harvest honey, when to treat for different pests and diseases and that sort of thing, get ready for swarming and make up boxes. Um, and another concept to, that's really important is um, the, the value and potential use of supplementary feeding and really having a purpose and a goal in mind when we're supplementary feeding, not just feeding for the sake of it, but what are you really trying to achieve by doing that and are you, how are you measuring the outcomes of doing that in terms of how much honey production you're getting and income. So some of the things we do with beekeepers overseas, we work on developing floral calendars, uh, field diaries, um, keeping records of when nectar and pollen's coming in, um, and doing pollen analysis and pollen trapping to look at some of the, the key uh, primary pollen sources uh, that are in some of these regions. Um, you can see that there's a real diversity of pollens coming in. That photo on the left there is from the highlands of Papua New Guinea. It's like a, almost like a rainbow. There's so many different flowers up in those regions. And also, um, yeah, supporting education and training extension on, on best practice supplementary feeding. So that's honeybee nutrition. Remember, no trees, no bees, no honey, no money. And the last pillar is education extension. I've actually divided this up into three different slides. So it's looking at education uh, training extension, but also quality assurance and marketing and good governance. So risk, inclusivity and vulnerability. And this is one of the most important pillars because without the, you know, the, there's a prevailing social and economic and political environmental conditions that, um, that it, they're really important determinants within the overall enabling environment of a beekeeping operation or industry. Um, and while some of these technical pillars for beekeeping are so critical to a successful operation, unless we can take this information and, and transfer it in a way that beekeepers can understand and actually implement that into their operations, then it's pretty hard for this to actually have that outcomes that we are looking for in terms of their productivity and their profits and their resilience of that beekeeping operation. So um, some of the sweet tips I've got on this slide is to think about the beneficiaries and ensure that there's ongoing mentorship throughout different changing seasons. So um, some of the research I've done overseas is showing that you know, a really important predictor of beekeepers' success and their income from beekeeping is actually that they, they didn't start just for the money. They started because they were actually interested and passionate about bees. And I think that speaks volumes for those successful beekeepers. Another thing is that a lot of successful beekeepers can identify a mentor. Uh, not just someone that came in and did some quick training. They had an ongoing relationship with someone who could show them how to manage bees throughout different changing seasonal conditions. So that's something that else is really critical. So training education extension. It's the core sweet tip here is to ensure that we're conducting outcome-based and practical training. So it's no good that people go to training days and um, you know they just get a certificate at the end and they can't actually demonstrate they have any skills. They need to be able to demonstrate and, and you've got to hand over the hive tool and let people actually do things for themselves to be able to actually learn it. 
Um, and it's often that we have, you know, very passionate beekeepers teaching beekeeping, but they don't give the participants a chance to actually have a go and have a dig themselves. There's something that's really critical with this training we work with overseas is that it's outcome based. Um, they have to be able to demonstrate they have the skill and that it's practically orientated. So not just sitting in a classroom talking about theory. There's so much theory around beekeeping that's really important, but not all of that theory is critical to just being able to keep your bees alive and harvest a, a crop of honey and keep pests and diseases at bay. So um, focus on those core skills, you know, how to light a bee smoke or identify a queen bee, etc. There's some really core skills there. And ensure that it's um, outcome-based and practically orientated. Something else that we do overseas has been a lot of fun and has also had a lot of impact is um, getting our beekeeping trainers together to give peer-to-peer -peer feedback on their training approaches. What do they do in a classroom? And then getting them up to present on a theoretical concept and then on a practical concept as well out in the field. And they give peer-to-peer -peer feedback. What's what, what they did well and how they can improve and they share ideas and tips and tricks and that sort of thing. So that's been something that's been really great in the education extension space. So ensure that training's outcome-based and is practically orientated. Quality assurance and marketing. So obviously we need to have a market in mind. Um, often local markets are usually the most suitable for achieving some of the highest prices, not always, but and often you know people want to consume local bee products. And the quality needs to reflect that market demand, obviously. Um, it can be really important to draw up participatory guarantee systems in some of these regions that we're working to basically improve the communication so it's not just a supply chain. We're thinking about a value chain here, so strengthening honey value chain linkages. And that's the relationship that people have the between the input suppliers, the producers of the product, the people who buy that and process it and package it and transport that product, the retailers and then the final consumers. So it's actually thinking about what do the consumers want first before we produce this product so we can actually try to deliver that to them so that they're willing to pay for that product. So trying to enhance some of those relationships between these different actors along that honey value chain can be really critical. And the last one is looking at risk. So this is good governance. We need to be actively inclusive and conscious of vulnerability to ensure that all people benefit from beekeeping operations. Um, something we've had success with is the family farms team approach in, in PNG and other areas to ensure that we're um, creating programs that are empowering women's groups and youth and war veterans um, through different mechanisms other than just participation. So it's about going beyond just being involved. It's about improving their agency, so people's skills and what skills they'd like to learn um, and that sort of thing, and that what they aspire to do with their beekeeping you know, operations or their aspirations, and looking at those relationships that they have within the industry. So um, with other beekeepers, with extension agents, with government organisations, with associations and NGOs, and these relationships can either enable them or actually make things more challenging for them. And also thinking about the political and governance structures that are there to ensure that different groups are not just included, but they're actively involved and have meaningful roles and they have a voice and, um, uh, you know, working effectively within the beekeeping industries. Um, so it's also important to be conscious of different shocks, um, trends and seasonality within any beekeeping operation or industry. So um, there's a photo here of a, an operation in PNG. We're doing some experiments and there'd been an earthquake there were some really cranky bees there, but thinking about how earthquakes or cyclones or drought and fires can impact on your operation and the industry is really important. I mean, we can't just assume these things are never going to happen. And if we think about it now, how we can actually respond to these, um, these shocks or trends and, and that sort of thing, we can be better prepared to actually respond to them in a way that's going to not have such a big impact. So the key thing here is to be actively inclusive and conscious of vulnerability. So they're the sweet tips. Try to use local bees and local inputs. Remember, productivity is not necessarily profitability. Um, keep bee breeding programs simple and focus on those core characteristics that are of value to the industries that are there. Um, try to identify, monitor, manage pests and disease pressures and bee biosecurity. Remember about honey nutri bee nutrition, so critical. No trees, no bees, no honey, no money. Um, think about who's involved in some of these programs, so the beneficiary selection process, and ensure that these people have ongoing mentorship throughout different changing seasons and climates. Um, ensure that training is outcome-based and has practical orientation, focusing on those core skills that are going to enable beekeepers to produce more honey. 
Um, and we need to be able to try to strengthen honey value chain linkages and be actively inclusive and conscious of vulnerability. So they're the five pillars for beekeeping for development, education, extension, honeybee nutrition, pests and diseases, genetics, and technologies. All right, thanks everyone for having me. Um, pleasure to be able to present at the Tokal Beekeepers Virtual Field Day. Thanks to the organising committee and the team at Tokal, New South Wales DPI. Um, and yeah, thank you all for joining in. Happy to take any questions. Feel free to be in touch via email. Uh, happy beekeeping.